One thing that gets easier as you go to smaller and smaller channel lengths is the operating frequency of a FET can go up. That is, the switching speed goes up, so it's useful for higher speed circuits or higher frequency circuits. Let's take a look at how that might be so by putting a FET in a simple common source amplifier circuit. So the source is grounded. The drain has a resistor taking it up to a DC power supply, V sub DD. We'll tap the drain and call that the output voltage. And the gate has an input signal, and that's what gets amplified. We'll follow the common sign convention of using the lowercase with serif V for AC signal and an uppercase for DC. So if there's a possibility of an AC being on there, you need to include the serif. And that's not going to affect our conclusions here, except I just want to make sure the diagram is right. The power supply is definitely DC. And what's going in on the gate is an AC signal. Just imagine a sinusoid coming in on the gate, and it's going to get bigger, hopefully, at the drain. And that's our input. We'll have current then. If, if you have the drain DC power supply hooked across everything go to ground, there's the opportunity for current to flow. So there is a current going through this resistor and into the MOSFET. That becomes the drain source current. So that is what's going through the, the resistor drain source current. And another thing I'll point out that we haven't had a lot of time to work on this course is the harmonic generation of MOSFETs. So MOSFETs have a lot more nonlinear generation if you operate them in the linear region. They function much more linearly if you place your operating point in saturation. And so we're going to look at what goes on in saturation. So the current that goes through here is ID sat. So just so you know, we're going to turn up the power supply high enough that the MOSFET is in saturation. And then we can uh, look at the output. In that case, we'll call that VD sat then. I'm, I'm sorry we haven't spent a lot of time on it. Those of you who know me know that uh, nonlinear distortion is sort of a research passion of mine, but uh, we're not uh, going into it in this course. Now, here's another thing. If you were to short the output, the drain terminal of the MOSFET, then all of this current will go through it, the short circuit. We're going to use that as a trick in order to come up with a maximum operating frequency for the circuit. So let's uh, keep that in mind. We're not going to always ha assume there's a short circuit at the output, but we're going to put one there later just to, to help us figure out the frequency. What goes in is this, let's say, a simple sinusoid that's uh, going to come out the drain terminal, hopefully larger, and also flipped 180 degrees is purely a negative feedback. So we, we have a complete phase shift on, on the output voltage. And that will simply explain maybe the presence of a minus sign here or there in our equations. That's all it's going to do for us. Otherwise, it's not an important detail for today. So let's write out the drain source current. That should really say ID sat, but it doesn't. Whatever current is going through the transistor, we can say is a consequence of two things. So you have the drain source voltage, the voltage across the drain in the source. You can say that the drain source current is a product of the drain source voltage times the channel conductance, which we've been calling G sub DS previously, and that's really what this derivative is. But it also depends on the gate voltage, not directly, right, because you have the oxide in between. If you bias the gate, you also get a shift in the drain source current by changing the thickness of the channel. And so the drain source current also depends on the gate source voltage times this dependence of drain source current on gate source voltage. Not an obvious dependence because the gate's over here and the drain's up there. Well, up there. That's what we were calling the mutual transconductance. And so I'll just write it that way. Whatever current is going from the drain to the source, whether you're in saturation or not, is the channel conductance times the drain source voltage plus the mutual transconductance times the gate source voltage. Now, actually, if you are in saturation, we'll, we'll talk about that being a GM sat. We derived that uh, not, not long ago. This gives us the output voltage. If you happen to know the current passing through the whole system, from resistor through MOSFET to ground. You multiply that current by the resistance and you have the output voltage. And then there's the minus sign account on account of the fact that the type of feedback causes a 180 degree phase shift. 
So that's how the MOSFET performs in a circuit, and these are parameters associated with the MOSFET, and until the end here, where we threw in the R, we, we weren't really considering the external circuit. There's also an equivalent circuit of a MOSFET. Back in lecture 54, we worked up a small signal model, and I'll remind you of the salient details here. We can look at four terminals in a simple model, one for the gate, and one for the drain, and one for the source, but well, two for the source, because the Drain voltage is always referenced to the source voltage, and the gate voltage is a reference to the source voltage. And so both the gate and the, the drain should have a source terminal near them. And so I'll just draw the source terminal with a line in between to indicate same potential all the way across. There's stuff in between. First of all, if you are looking at the gate terminal, what do you see? I think what you see is the oxide capacitance and possibly uh, depletion layer capacitance. Especially in saturation, you're going to see a lot of depletion layer capacitance, and it's going to cause this to, to actually be different than just oxide. We'll just keep it simple today and, and indicate the oxide capacitance. Now, if you look at it from the drain, you see a pathway to the source. And so you'll see conductance. This is the channel conductance. Conductance is just one over resistance. But you also see the ability of a lot of current to go. So how do you model all of the current passing from the drain to the source? You can take a conductance and put an ideal current source across it like this and apply Kirchhoff's laws and a, a circuit simulator can actually handle then the passage of current from the drain to the source in this network right here. And what, how do you label that ideal current source? And so a circle with an arrow through it indicates it's ideal and uh, maybe I should have used a uh, quadrilateral. It's ideal and it's dependent. A dependent current source means that it depends on something else in the circuit. So the amount of current that this source produces depends on the gate source voltage. And it depends on it through the transconductance, the mutual transconductance, which now I'm going to write as GM sat because we have been saying, we're, let's do this in saturation. That is the amount of current that is flowing through there. When you draw it across the GD sat like that, it's the amount of current that is going through the channel conductance. If I put a short circuit across the source to the drain, that's the amount of current that will go through that short circuit. You may want to put a ground symbol on this line. I didn't do that. Now, this is a funny looking circuit, right? It's, it looks like two different circuits. They just both happen to be sharing a common ground here. You can have a more direct pathway from the gate to the drain. It's capacitive. We'll write it as the gate drain capacitance. It tends to be very small. It is a consequence of the metallic gate overlapping the drain terminal. That's usually managed in the fabrication to be very small. So this gate drain capacitor is often not included in analysis. We just treat this almost as an open circuit, only because there's usually very little, if any, overlap between the metallic gate and the drain pad. So let's look into the circuit from the left and ask, what's the impedance that you see? Keep in mind that this capacitance is just going to be taken as very, very small, so that there's an open circuit there. You basically see the oxide capacitance. So we'll say the input impedance is the oxide capacitive impedance, minus J times the oxide capacitor's reactance, minus J over omega C oxide. Again, just ignoring the gate drain capacitance. The fact that we are in saturation does mean that, that there is actually a little bit more capacitance here due to the very thick uh, depletion layer. Now let's look at the other side. If I'm looking at from the right, and I say, well, what's going to go on these terminals? I'm not going to ask too much about the impedance because it's simply the GD set, so that's set. What are we going to do with it? Somehow we have to make use of it. If you put a voltmeter probe right across the drain source terminals, you would measure an output voltage. But an output voltage with no current may not be able to do anything. So you actually have a load on the output, which is not going to be infinite and is not going to be zero. We're going to make it zero so that we can do this trick I said, where you force all of this current, GM sat times V gate source, through a wire. And we can look at the gain of the system. So let's look at GM sat for starters. Let's get this uh, straightened out because we are going to come up with an expression for the gain of this amplifier and we don't want GM sat hanging around. We want to replace it with what it is. We worked out an expression previously. Remember the transconductance is DIDS by DVGS. It's always a derivative of 
current with voltage is a dynamic resistance in which the current in the derivative depends on a voltage somewhere else in the circuit. And we came up with this expression in saturation back in, I guess it was lecture 54. And so we're going to use that going forward. And there's also the GD sat, which is going to uh, conveniently drop out. So I'm not going to uh, work out anything about it. Just to remind you what it is, this is the channel conductance. So now let's short circuit the output. Put a wire right across the drain to source, or otherwise declare Z sub L equal to zero. And when we do that, we can talk about the gain that's of, of current. Yes, how much more current is coming out than is going in, where the input is the current here at the gate, and the output is the current at the load. Now we can talk about this a little bit. How can you send current in the gate when all there are capacitors here? Well, it's at AC, you can do that. When that frequency gets really, really small, this capacitance becomes more and more of an open circuit until you get to DC, where it's a perfectly open circuit. At high frequencies, you can absolutely can have an input current. So we're going to take this ratio of the output current to the input current when you have a short circuit across the drain source. And we're just going to put in what these things are. By putting that short circuit there, we can say that the current coming out is that GM sat V gate source. And the current going in is just Ohm's law, right? So it's the voltage divided by the impedance going into the, the transistor. So you have V gate source over Z in, and we've talked already about what Z in is. And so you can use that expression. Z in was minus J divided by omega C oxide. Put that expression in here. You have that. I, I just keep the absolute value signs for now just because of this fact that imaginary numbers and phase do sneak into this. And so we have this expression that's replaced GM sat with what it is. I'll ditch the absolute values and the J. Now we have an expression, almost. Uh, one thing I'd point out is the input impedance depends on the oxide capacitance. If you say input impedance is minus J divided by omega C oxide, the C oxide you're talking about is the actual capacitance in farads. The C oxide in the expression for the mutual transconductance is the capacitance per unit area. So they're not the same C. Notice the serifs on one of them and not on the other one. Easily rectified, because capacitance is capacitance per unit area times area. So let's replace C oxide with serifs, referring to the absolute capacitance of the oxide, with the little c, capacitance per unit area, times the area of the gate, which we already have worked into here. We already have W and L in our expression. Let's just have more of that, right? The area of the gate is the width of the gate times the length of the gate. And so put that in instead. And you can simplify everything, and we have this expression for the current gain of a short-circuited MOSFET. All we have is a resistor on the drain and a, a direct input at the gate and ground at the source. It has the length of the channel in it squared. It has the surface mobility. So we're going to talk about these two parameters. And there's also the gate bias. So the, the more you bias the gate, the more gain you end up getting when you operate in saturation. So we see as the frequency goes up, the gain goes down. At low frequency, you have lots of current gain from a MOSFET. So MOSFETs are great at low frequency. But you get to a certain high frequency, and the MOSFET becomes pretty not useful <laughs> for amplifier circuits. It can't give you more than it takes in. At some frequency, this gain gets less than 1. Barring any really better criteria, we'll say that's the frequency where it becomes unuseful. So that's the maximum operating frequency, is the frequency where this gain becomes 1. And the higher frequencies, this gain is less than 1. So we'll call it the unity gain frequency. When gain equals 1, the frequency that makes that happen is called the unity gain frequency. It's not showing up here, but write it down, the unity gain frequency. And we can solve for that. Just set this expression in the box here to equal to 1 and rearrange for f. And just call it f max. The key things are that the unity gain frequency, the maximum operating frequency, goes as the surface mobility divided by the channel length squared. And those are parameters that we are going to actively work on adjusting. How do you get higher mobility? How do you get a shorter channel length? Those are what the foundry community work very hard at doing. Let's take a look at that over the next few weeks. 
when you're in saturation, the input impedance isn't quite minus J over omega C oxide, but it is about three halves minus J over omega C oxide. And the consequence of that actually is good. What it means is that the maximum operating frequency you calculate with this is a little on the low side. It will actually be 50% higher, but we're not going to go into that because we haven't gone into why that would, would show up, that two-thirds. So we'll just stick with this. We're going to look at justifying our mission to reduce the gate length. And that's a little conclusion I have for you, that high mobility or short channel gives you a higher frequency operation. This F max is not a number you're likely to see on any data sheets for MOSFETs, simply because it's kind of an internal parameter that has nothing to do with the circuit. As soon as you put a transistor in a circuit, you have a different maximum operating frequency. The, the switching speed of a transistor circuit depends heavily on things like external resistances and especially in external capacitances. I mean, you're going to put a, a re resistor on the gate just to, to dampen oscillations, to prevent oscillations. That's going to change your maximum operating frequency of the circuits tremendously. Uh, the, the current delivering ability of the power supply is going to affect the maximum operating frequency. So a lot of things affect it. And so it's not really a, a figure of merit that gets put on, on data sheets. Uh, although you can back it out of the data that's on the data sheets frequently, but it's not, not really given usually. Nevertheless, it's a figure of merit that device engineers keep in mind simply because of the guidance given to us by the ratio of mu over L squared. We want to make that ratio as large as possible. Okay, and that's what we're going to do for the rest of the semester.